All right, good morning, everyone. This uh, June 27th meeting of the Coastal Resilience Advisory Committee is convening at 10.04 a.m. by video conference pursuant to Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. This meeting is being recorded. Please be aware that other people may be able to see you and take care not to share your device's screen. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. Please silence all phones and devices. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment. For items with public comment, the chair will afford uh, public comment to members of the public that have joined the meeting via Zoom. Uh, if you wish to speak, you may state your name and be acknowledged by and speak through the chair. Uh, you can use the raise hand button in the Zoom app in order to indicate your interest and all questions should be directed through the chair. If you're not able to participate in the remote meeting, you may also submit comments to Leah Hill. Her email is lhill at nantucket-ma.gov. I am Mary Longacre, Chair of the Coastal Resilience Advisory Committee. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Gary Beller? Here. Dara Boyce? Here. Peter, uh, excuse me, Carl Borchert? Here. Peter Brace. Here. And uh, Joanna Roach. Here. And I miss Christy Kickham. Here. Okay, and I don't see the remaining members. All right. Um, anticipated speakers on the agenda, please confirm uh, that you can hear us. Uh, Ashley Ersman, Chair of the, of the Conservation Commission. Present. Thank you, Ashley. And um, finally, um, each vote taken in this meeting will be conducted by a roll call vote. Turning to the agenda, our first item is a discussion with uh, Ashley as the CONCOM representative of Coastal Resilience Impacts from the proposed new wetland regulations. Thank you for joining us, Ashley. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for having me. Um, I'll, I'll try and keep it brief, but I, I think as everybody's aware, um, the Conservation Commission has been in the process of updating our regulations really for the past couple of years and in the last nine months have really um, gotten to um, kind of um, the, the bulk of these updates and, and we're trying to get them approved, hopefully at some point in July. Um, as far as coastal resilience is concerned, uh, the updates to our regulation incorporate um, the language from Nantucket's coastal resiliency plan. So some of the newer definitions, acknowledging sea level rise, that's all incorporated uh, into our new draft regulation. So I think um, myself and commissioners feel that it's really important that you know these town documents are um, cohesive and work together. Uh, we're also um, in the process of hopefully updating our, our buffer zones so that um, there's an extra 25 foot buffer essentially uh, between structural elements and resource areas. So as far as coastal resilience is concerned, that would increase buffer areas to things like beaches, dunes, banks, and bluffs. So currently, um, property owners and applicants are allowed to put structures within 50 feet of um, kind of the, the coastline and those coastal um, resource areas. Uh, and if our updates go through, that would push back to 75 feet. So essentially increasing uh, the buffer space um, really in, in hopes of increasing resiliency if, if you have less structures in the way of, of a moving coastline. Uh, the other piece that's up for discussion is uh, banning structures uh, such as pools from land subject to coastal storm flowage. Uh, pools um, have the potential to mix with floodwaters uh, depending on where, where they sit. Uh, and you know, in discussions with the commission and, and scientific literature, uh, we feel that structures such as pools are, are dangerous in um, land subject to coastal storm flowage, especially when you look at the um, projected uh, kind of increase in, in flood zone in the coming years. Uh, so I believe those are uh, kind of the main updates that would impact uh, coastal resiliency. Great, thank you, Ashley. Uh, do any of the committee members have questions for Ashley? Gary? Ashley, thank you uh, for that good work. I'm thrilled with the suggestions that you folks have made 
being a Brand Point resident, I've been screaming for five years. Every time I see another project here, everyone seems to have to put a pool in, even though they're clearly in the flood zone. And even though I go to the planning board meetings, I show up at the HCC, it doesn't matter. They say there's nothing we can do about it. So I'm thrilled that you folks have made that recommendation. What is it that uh, you need, you folks need to do to get these rules finally approved? Who, who or how, what is the process for getting them finally enacted? Um, so through the chair, um, we have held one uh, public meeting where there was, you know, true public input that was about um, three weeks ago now. Um, and there will be a second uh, public meeting probably in late July. We're in the process of scheduling that. Um, and hopefully at that point, the public will feel they have had enough input and, and the commission will be able to, to finally vote on the regulations. Um, after uh, we vote, there is a time period, kind of a wait period for the new regulations to be officially enacted. That's also something we're looking into initially. Um, it had been suggested it could be as short as 30 days, and now we're receiving some pushback on that, so it might need to be a little bit longer. Um, we're also, of course, um, having commission appointments tomorrow, so there's potential for some turnover, which could also um, delay or hold up some of these changes, but I think if, if all goes well, um, hopefully... Uh, you know, by midsummer, we'll be able to get these on the books. Thank you, Ashley. Sarah? Thank you, Mary. Um, <laughs> Ashley, I was just curious, because I wasn't, I didn't attend the public meeting. Um, have there been any pushback or questions around the um, impacts, like the coastal resiliency changes to the regulations? Like, is there anything kind of floating to the surface in that? No pun intended. No, um, no, none at all. Um, there's definitely been some pushback for the increased uh, buffer zones. Um, uh, individuals and applicants feeling like people will lose property rights or the ability to, to build in these areas. Um, we also have been receiving um, a fair amount of pushback on uh, banning pools in the, in the flood zone. Um, so as much kind of support as the commission can get, in seeing the value um, and kind of encouraging a more sustainable future given the projected sea level rise would be really helpful for us. Other comments? All right, well, I would uh, encourage everyone who's interested to attend the next public meeting for the regulations. Um, and that will be posted on the town's website. Uh, Ashley, I imagine you'll be doing a bit of a, a media push on that as well. Yes, we're in the process of getting dates out. So I think by the commission's next meeting, which I believe is July 6th, we should have um, kind of the date set and then there will be um, you know, advertising of that. Great. Well, Ashley, again, thank you very much for joining us this morning and uh, for working on those regulations with Coastal Resilience in mind. We appreciate that. Well, thank you for having me and thank you for all the hard work you guys do in pushing coastal resilience locally. Thank you. All right, next item on our agenda is uh, authorization of the reissuance of the Coastal Zone Management Grant Application Support Letter that we wrote last year and a request from Leah for feedback on the grant application. So a copy of the letter was included in the packet. Uh, Leah, if you wanna put that up on the screen. And essentially, um, since they we're applying for a grant for the same project, but we're simply updating the application based on the feedback that we got from the original application, which was not uh, funded. I, I don't anticipate that we would need to change this letter, um, but certainly open to commission or committee members' comments and um, anything that you wanted to offer in that respect. Carl? My name is not on uh, the list of committee members. Uh, you, you, thank you, Carl. Yeah, I, I did notice that and I forgot to mention it. Yes, we do need to update the list of committee members. There's several people not listed. Um, has it already gone out to CZM or is it gonna be further no. refined and then sent out? No, this is last year's letter that we're looking oh. at on the screen. And so the purpose today is to um, 
flag any revisions and authorize it to be reissued and sent. Okay, I just misunderstood it was last year's because it had 621.23 on it. That's an automatic feature of WERS. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Ho hopefully you won't forget me. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we need to put Christy on and um, uh, who else was the, uh, uh, Rachel as well. Uh, so any other comments from committee members on the content of the letter or anything we'd want to abstract change um, given that we will be updating you know the date and the um, list of committee members and I don't think there's anything else specific in the text Leah I think the rest is all um, you know set Mary yes Gary I thought Leah uh, sent out a, when she sent out a note I mean I I, I sent back a support letter from the, our advisory committee of non-voting there was a slight change to the title that included the word design. Leah, okay. is that correct? Leah, we'll need to, to make sure that we have the correct grant title in there. Yeah. Thank you, Gary. Yeah. The new one includes the, something about design as well. Not, taking not, nothing away, but just adding that other mm -hmm. uh, usage for the funds. Yeah, thank you, Gary. Um, I was just going to say that the, the title has changed a little bit. It's still, you know, the recommendation, the phase one, um, but we are going for more of a design. So we're hoping to do a 30% design um, for this project. Okay. Carl? Yeah, you, 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 you read the text, it says primary project to pursue for funding, which I fully understand, but is this in concert with the primary project of the Steamship Authority terminal, or is this the primary town one and the Steamship is going to be responsible for their terminal? Just a little confused about what's the primary project. I understand this is a, a primary project for us. But so how does Jive um, Steamship Terminal being the number one identified project? So the uh, committee voted last year that the downtown neighborhood flood barrier was the uh, primary project to pursue for funding. And that is from the town's perspective. Um, the Steamship Authority has said that they are certainly open to working with the town in the overall design for the area, but their property is not uh, one that the town can um, you know, work on. Um, so I would expect to be working together with the Steamship Authority, but this part of it as a design phase is, is not going to involve construction. Uh, so, uh, and, and Leah, if you need to jump in, um, feel free, but uh, because I haven't seen the, the grant application yet myself. Um, so so I, we, we are not um, looking for funding for this on behalf of the Steamship, I guess is what right. I'm trying to say. It's on behalf I, of the town. Okay. Thank you, Mary. I understand. I understand better now. Thank you. Leah? Yeah, so it's just the area um, before Steamship Wharf, and it goes to uh, Straight Wharf, so basically like Easy Street, um, and it's just for feasibility and design. So once you get a 30% design, you can bring that and get extra funding through you know, federal grants and stuff like that. So we're hoping that this is the first step of that project um, if the grant is funded. I do have a couple suggestions for the letter. Um, mm -hmm. I think it would be important to put that it is, I don't, I'm not sure if it's stated somewhere else, but that it is a high priority and that the implementation date, you know, put the year that we're hoping, or that was recommended to implement it because that might show them that like, you know, we really need to, to start this ASAP. I think that's a good suggestion. Other comments from committee members? All right, if we are generally happy with the letter, does somebody want to make a motion to um, approve that the Coastal Resilience Advisory Committee sends a letter in support of the grant, uh, the letter to be corrected, or I should say updated with the uh, current grant name, the current committee membership, and with Leah's suggestion to add language, noting that this is part of a uh, time-sensitive, uh, high-priority project in the Coastal Resilience Plan. I'll make a motion to 
So I'll second it. Okay, so a motion from Carl, second from Gary. Uh, roll call vote. Gary Beller. Aye. Sarah Boyce. Aye. Carl Borchard. Aye. Peter Brace. Aye. Christy Kickham. Aye. Joanna Roach. Aye. And Mary Longacre, aye. Thank you. Um, so Lee, if we can turn that around this week, I know you have a deadline. Um, by all means, I'm, I'm available when you need me. Okay, thank you, Mary. And did you also want to speak about um, having people help you with the grant? Yeah, so I know that um, some members have expressed interest in helping with um, you know, writing grants or reading them over. <clears throat> the timeline, um, so it's due July 11th, and I met with Arcadis last week who helped with the original grant. Um, and we've decided you know, to shift it a little bit, like I had mentioned, and having more of a design aspect of it than just the feasibility. Um, and that's because the feedback from CZM was that they really want it focused on, you know, on a project um, and a little bit less on the education, although that will be part of the grant as well. Um, so that's what we're doing there. And they are going to update the scope and the budget. And then when they do that, they'll send it to me and I'll update a little. There's you know, so, some sections in there that um, express how this proposal will fulfill the grant. So once I've received their stuff, I'll update my part of it. And then if committee members are interested, I can email it to you all to read over it and offer your comments or edits. And that would be really appreciated. Um, again, it, it probably will be a little bit of a, a quick turnaround. I apologize for that, but that's kind of how these grants work. So um, yeah, if anybody's interested, that'd be great. And just reach out directly to you. Yep, they can reach out directly to me. Okay, thank you, Leah. Um, Turning to the next item on the agenda, continued discussion on next best steps for Sconset Bluff Coastal Resilience. So again, in the packet, we sent out the draft um, statement. And uh, again, this, this was developed um, simply to try and encompass as much of what people expressed as was possible. So there, there's no pride of, of uh, authorship here, as Vince likes to say. Um, you, we certainly able to change this language. And so we're bringing this back to the committee after our last discussion to um, see where we'd like to go with this. Hopefully members have had a chance to review and um, think of any suggestions. Any comments or questions from members? Gary? Well, Mary, I like the way you put it together last um, uh, last time, and I still like it this time. So <laughs> I, I'm comfortable with it. I know Matt Fee was a little bit uncomfortable with some of the language in the second paragraph, and I started looking to see whether you know we should just take that out and just use the first and the third paragraph with the, uh, the opening words changed a little bit. But but I'm very comfortable with the whole thing the way you put it together. Uh, and I, I, I wasn't offended by anything in that second paragraph. Matt seemed to have some concerns about it, but otherwise I think it's the right statement to make. Thank you, Gary. Other comments from members? Sarah? Thanks, Mary. Yeah, I think I, I agree with Gary overall that I think that this is fine i still kind of reiterate from from last time that um the less we say the better and just point to the coastal resiliency plan but i understand the need to kind of put something forth so i just wanted to say that that i think um that standing behind the what's in the coastal resiliency plan and and was already hashed out much more is is fine i don't love the second paragraph because i think even mentioning geotubes is like a people will hyper-focus on that, but I think that nothing is like egregious here. So I feel like if this is what everybody wants, then I would support it. I think there was a suggestion um, and I'm, you know, I'm going off of memory. So, you know, this is, um, you know, just throwing it out there for consideration. 
um, that the second paragraph could be modified by specifying in the long term. Um, so the second to last sentence, I think, would be speak against relying on such structures in the long term in highly dynamic and vulnerable environments. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, that's completely up to uh, consideration by the committee. It doesn't have to be added, but I, if I'm remembering correctly, that was one of the suggestions. Christy? Uh, I was just gonna, if that second cent, uh, paragraph stays the way it is, I'd maybe uh, replace the word structures with maybe measures, um, because some do use plantings as a method of uh, control, which doesn't really define a structure. Uh, so a geotube is a, uh, is a structure. I, I think this was, um, written specifically about structures and changing it to measures is a very different, um, it, it encompasses a much wider scope, which I think is the point you're trying to make, Christy. Yeah. yeah. But I don't think that the middle part of the paragraph applies equally to all other kinds of measures. Um, so I'd like to hear from the committee. Um, yeah, I was, uh, yeah, I was just trying to generalize a little bit and not be as you know Sarah said about people hyper focusing on the geotubes. I was just trying to sort of soften it a little bit. Um, uh, but uh, I get it. Sarah. Um First of all, there's like crazy lightning right outside my building. So if I'm lost, <laughs> I will like come back. Um, I I don't necessarily think that the second paragraph is even necessary. I think the first paragraph states it very well what our what our like what our statement is that we really want everyone to continue to negotiate and it's really important and I think especially the last sentence of the first paragraph I think um is really important um that we have to think of the island community as a whole um I don't think that the second paragraph is entirely necessary for the purpose of this statement, right? So in the Coastal Resiliency Plan, we there's more a nuance and a detailed discussion of the different measures. I think the point of the statement is to just say like, as the committee, all the things we've learned and discussed, we know that this is super important. And also it's not more important than the whole of the island community. So I think, while it's not untrue, the second paragraph, I just think that um, being prescriptive at all or talking about specifics that like any specifics kind of muddy the message, which is the point is that the, that the relocation of the road and retreat need to be discussed. It's kind of. So that's I would I would vote for that. All right, um, Leah, can you do um, a just take the third paragraph and move it up above the second. I don't want to delete the language of the second from the screen just yet, but I want to be able to evaluate the statement with looking at just the first and second, the new second paragraph now. So eliminating the third without actually removing it from the screen. Um, give uh, committee members a moment to read through that. Um, and I'm, I've got the Coast Resilience Plan up on my other screen. I'm going to try and look for the specific page um, and we may, want to insert a reference to that. Uh, comments from committee members? Well, I think the now third paragraph, you just lose the word geotubes and say, although erosion construction are effective at reducing erosion, they have to make some mention of, of the structures. People have to know what we're talking about, that we're considering it, that we are aware of the impact of these structures. Because I mean, I just think that, you know, now that SBPF is pulled away and it looks like they're going to come out, maybe. People are just going to do what they want. Um, I just think, anyway, I just think it, it belongs. 
Well, then maybe you should put the third paragraph back and just take and do what Peter's saying, put it back in there, but just take out that the word geo to just say, although erosion control structures are effective, and maybe that'll just reduce the, uh, um, the, the, the issues that some people are worried about. Other committee members, Carl? Yeah, I've, um, you know, I've watched this uh, debate for as long as everybody else in this room here. And um, when I submitted my homework assignment, I uh, supported geotubes, uh, having walked down there and seeing them um, in action and working. Um, my sense from this discussion this morning is that we're going to you know, support uh, abandonment and removal of geotubes. Um, with some um, reference to other erosion control structures, which is a sense, uh, you know, I'm trying to be sensitive to the island. I'm trying to be sensitive to the board, the committee's opinions, but I personally do not uh, support uh, uh, um, manage retreat and, and relocating the road. I support engineering structures such as geotubes that can solve um, the erosion problem and preserve property and roads. Um, I'm not too excited as a taxpayer to spend 50 to $80 million relocating Baxter Road. I understand the CRP uh, with the consultancy has advised us um, to you know, look into keeping them, the geotubes temporarily, but then you're gonna have to face up to relocation and you're gonna have to face up to manage retreat. Um, this issue has polarized the community for decades, and uh, I just don't support, um, you know, I, I support the geotubes, and I'm, I might be the lone wolf. I, I'm a proprietor of the island. I was elected at town meeting to be one of the proprietors by Catherine Stover to defend the beaches, and I wrote a letter years ago saying that you're not going to win a battle with the North Atlantic Ocean, but I changed my mind. Um, I advocate for large engineering structures at sea to generate energy. And uh, I advocate for engineering solutions to problems of erosion. And um, that's just my two cents. I mean, I, I'm a new member, um, I'm controversial with this, but uh, I don't support managed retreat and I don't support relocating the road and I support protecting the bluff um, with the geotubes and the expansion of them. And I support vegetating the bluff above them and, and educating property owners about runoff from rain and, and irrigation systems that could affect the top of the bluff. So I've studied this very extensively and I've done my homework on it before I came on this committee. But I'm, I guess I'm the lone wolf. I, I support geotubes. I support their expansion. And I was down there with my own two eyes watching them work. Um, I'm willing to give up a little lowering of the beach and narrowing of the beach. Um, and um, that to me is not a big problem for a couple of miles of geotubes versus 53 miles of beach on the whole island. Um, this debate's going to go on and uh, you're going to have other challenges to erosion all the way around the island, like the airport runway and Madiket and uh, the town. But I'm sorry that we're fighting about this for 30 years, but um, I'm pretty uh, pretty strong in my opinion. And that, that's just my two cents as a committee member. Thank you. Thank you, Carl, Sarah, and then Peter. Thank you, Mary. Um, no, with due respect to Carl, I think that um, reminding us that this letter is very specific to this location. So, um, this letter does not say that this committee doesn't support geotubes or erosion control measures or engineering structures anywhere else. And so my opinion would be rather than us get into the debate that many other committees have had um, for a long period of time, that taking out the word geotube is because that's not the focus of this letter. So we're not saying that geotubes are um, in general are bad or not. I'm saying that because we've already have the, the CRP, I think that um, I would be okay putting that second paragraph back in and saying something like, although erosion co control structures, and you could even say such as geotubes if it needs to say geotubes, but I, I really just think that the focus of here is, um, 
is about the relocation of the road and discussing managed retreat. Now, I know that this is a sensitive topic and it's gonna be something that's talked about for many different locations. All we're seeing here is that it needs to be discussed. And I think Carl, that we as a committee that serves the entire island would be doing this neighborhood a disservice with all that we know that even if the most intense engineering structures were put in this area, at some point this area is gonna to continue to erode. Um, even when there's plantings, all it is is buying time. Um, we've, and so I think as I feel a responsibility to the community that we emphasize that this, like just as we're saying in that first paragraph, that we're encouraging the, the parties involved to continue to negotiate because there needs to be a plan um, in place for both moving the road and relocation. It doesn't have to happen tomorrow, but it's just encouraging this discussion um, to continue because I really feel like we're, you know, it's a responsibility with what we know to the community. And so I think if we want to put that second paragraph back in, it says that there are measures that can, you know, maybe effectively buy time, but it, it as that last sentence in that paragraph says, it's still a dynamic and vulnerable environment. Um, and so that discussion needs to continue to make a, a plan. So thank you, Mary. Thank you, Sarah. Peter? I agree with everything that Sarah just said. And I wanted to add uh, that, you know, the cost of moving the road is gonna be what it's gonna be. But if we're looking at maintaining those geotubes going in, into long-term, I wanna know where all the sand's gonna come from and how we're gonna get it here and how we're going to constantly keep those geotubes covered um, because the you know the you know one of the failure criteria of the geotubes project that that uh, SBPF didn't meet was keep them covered after a storm um, they become a hard structure with the waves reverberating off of them on the ends they there is end scour there's destruction of the bluff um, there's so many reasons um, and so where's the sand going to come from it's not going to come from here. It's going to come from a shoal. It's going to be trucked on. Who's going to pay for that? Um, that that's an additional expense um, to moving the road as well. So again, I agree with what Sarah said. Thank you, Peter. Carl? I can answer that question, but I'll yield to any other members who haven't had a chance to speak yet. If anybody wants to speak uh, before I answer Peter's question, in my opinion. I think the only member we haven't heard from yet is Joanna. Joanna, did you want to weigh in on this? Yes. I mean, I don't have anything that I think is super important to add to the conversation, Mary. I, 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 um, appreciate Carl's comments. And also, you know, I think I said this last time, I'm not sure, I wasn't sure, and I'm still not sure that sending this letter has any kind of real impact. I mean, I would hope that the select board is consulting the, uh, the CRP as they're going along with any decisions like this. And I appreciate the idea that, you know, us sending a letter supports the coastal resiliency plan, but, in terms of us coming to consensus on the sand and the geotubes and the process, I, I'm, I struggle with how that's going to be productive if our group necessarily can't reach consensus on that. <laughs> if that makes sense. Yes, we, we, we have the option of not sending a letter um, if, if that turns out to be the consensus. Um, so Carl, we'll go back to you. No, I just, uh, I wrote in my, my homework that the solution with the sand is simple. It's done up and down the eastern seaboard, um, pump it in from offshore with a barge and a pipe three to four to five times a year to cover the geotubes. Um, bringing it in by barge at the Steamship Authority is not a good idea. Trucks are pounding on the roads, um, hauling it to the, to the site to pump it onto the geotubes from the bluff. The simple solution is to pump it in from offshore um, regularly to cover the geotubes. Um, it's done in Ocean City, Maryland. It's done in Delaware uh, routinely to 
keep beaches intact, um, which generate billions of dollars in tourism money for those communities. So the technology to pump in sand from offshore on geotubes exists and it's been used for years. Um, and I also will note that when I took that site visit, I did not see extreme scouring on either side of the geotubes. Um, I don't know, uh, not being a scientist, what the story is with that, but, um, and I'm not an expert on sand drift up and down the, the system uh, to Quidnet and to uh, Low Beach, but I did not see a lot of scouring and maybe because it wasn't the storm season of the winter, but you know, if you want to get sand on those geotubes three to five times a year, pump it in from offshore from a barge dredge. And uh, it's simply, it's simple. It's been done for decades uh, up and down the U.S. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Um, Leah, it, uh, unfortunately, Vince was not able to attend. He had to be at another event. Um, Leah, are you familiar enough with the state laws to know whether or not that's permissible in Massachusetts? One of the things that we always have to deal with is just because somebody else can do it doesn't mean that we can here with our state laws. Um, I'm not 100% sure, but I, I'm pretty sure you can nourish beaches in Massachusetts. I'd have to look into it further. I, I'm sorry, I, I meant specifically um, mining the sand offshore and pumping it onto the beach. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'll look, I'll, I'll have to look into that. Well, it, that's getting a little far from our topic. Um, so I, I just wanted to check in to see if we had an answer for that, but um, maybe that's something you can update us on later. Um, so back to this letter, um, I, I want to acknowledge that we do have members of the public in attendance. Um, this is an internal discussion. This is not a discussion where public comment is available. Um, so thank you for your interest and please wait for the public comment period. Um, Further discussion from committee members, Gary? Well, I think that uh, we should go back to the original letter, take out the word geotubes and just say, although erosion control structures are effective. So we just take out the words GOT, geotubes and other and, and, and leave it as that second paragraph without, the, without those two words. Uh, I think the most important message in the whole letter is the uh, it's the last sentence of now it's the second paragraph which is it's a sense of urgency for the road relocation and manage retreat okay that's what we need to do we need to continue to tell the select board they should continue with a sense of urgency because the longer we take to figure out the road relocation, the more expensive it's going to be. We started this in 2013 and we're still far away from there and the expenses have quadrupled since then. So that to me is the most important part of this letter so to, to make the select board understand they should continue treating this the, with a sense of urgency with, that, with respect to the road relocation. Thank you, Gary. Um, I'm going to read from the coastal resilience plan. Um, so bear with me, it's a, a long paragraph, just to make sure that we are uh, comfortable with um, being in congruence with that language. So I'm looking at page 210 of the PDF that I have for the final coastal resilience plan. It says the, um, let's see, let me start here. Okay. I'm. I'm I'm gonna cut out where it doesn't talk about Sconset Bluff. So, um, so the, the header for this is erosion management for infrastructure and buildings. This is the strategy overview section for Sconset. Um, actually, I'm gonna begin at the beginning. So strategy overview to address each of the resilience challenges identified through this study and other studies, including the Baxter Road long-term planning study a set of recommended resilience strategies is identified for near-term implementation by the town, property owners, and other stakeholders. The approaches recommended for Scotset were developed with protection and adaptation of local historic district in mind and are sensitive to the historic character of the community. 
Erosion is the primary concern facing Sconset and managing its impacts on private property and public infrastructure is a priority in the area. The Baxter Road long-term planning study focused on alternatives analysis for technically feasible approaches to address the bluff and toe erosion in the area of Sconset Bluff from Butterfly Lane to Sankety Lighthouse, resulting in recommendation adaptation approaches for that stretch of shoreline. Outside of this stretch, and then it goes on to talk about CO2 and, and other areas. So I'm gonna skip till we go back to the bluff. Um, it says the Baxter Road long-term planning study recommends near-term actions, including maintenance and monitoring of existing tow protection measures with dune nourishment along the bluff in accordance with the permit that has been issued for the system. Dune restoration, beach nourishment, planting and stabilization of the bluff face and homeowner best management practices are also recommended. In parallel, given the imminent risk to buildings and infrastructure in this area, the town should plan for and begin implementing the relocation of Baxter Road while also engaging stakeholders in discussions around an acceptable timeline for retreat and relocation of structures. The existing tow protection system in place along portions of the bluff should remain until planning for road relocation and retreat is complete. Recommendations in the CRP are intended to be consistent with the recommendations of the Baxter Road long-term planning study. So that is what the CRP says about the Sconset Bluff. Does that change or does that offer any suggestion um, to anyone for this statement? All right, so um, Leah, would you go ahead and put this, the, what is now the third paragraph back second and take Gary's suggestion of removing the three words, uh, geoturbs and other? Okay, so this is the statement that has been most recently suggested. Um, so let's work with this. Sarah? Um, can I make another suggestion? Um, instead of are effective, can I say maybe? Because since we're making it a more general, you know, erosion control structures may be effective at reducing erosion at their specific location while okay. properly maintained. Does that make sense? Uh, Leah, go ahead and make that edit and we'll take comments from other commissioners. Sounds good to me. anyone else have a suggestion for this statement as shown on the screen? Um, and, and, you know, again, it's still wide open. We're not locked into this language. If anyone has uh, an alternative they want to bring up. All right. If there are no comments, uh, Gary? I'd like to make a motion to approve this letter. That's what I was going to ask for, Gary. Thank you. Uh, we have a motion from Gary. Does anyone want to second that? I'll second it, Mary. Okay, thank you, Joanna, for seconding. Is there any further discussion? All right, seeing no further discussion, we'll roll call vote. Gary Beller? Aye. Dara Boyce? Aye. Bob Borchard? No. Peter Brace? Aye. Christy Kickham? Aye. Joanna Roach? Aye. And uh, I, in the past, abstained on this. I'm going to continue to abstain on it. Um, so I believe that gives us five ayes, one nay, and one abstention. Uh, so we can um, go ahead and submit this. And this will be, um, as we are advisory to the select board, this will be submitted to the select board. Thank you all. Uh, next item on our agenda is an introduction to the zoning bylaw review tool published by the EPA Southeast New England program and Mass Audubon. So we have uh, that website. Carl was kind enough to uh, poke around in there and see what we had. Uh, so he has a, a synopsis. I, I found the site rather difficult to navigate because they keep sending you to other pages. Um, so thank you, Carl, for taking a look at it. And then they also offer uh, some tools on the site that will just um, show you well, what those can do. Um, but it was a bit daunting to try and actually use them. Um, so Carl, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I'm just gonna read a few things really quickly here. Um, perhaps we can have a brief discussion about this um, 
This is a report on Mass Audubon zoning regulations review tool from a coastal resilience perspective. Um, you can download the Mass Audubon bylaw and review to uh, snepnetwork.org forward slash bylaw dash review forward slash. It's an Excel spreadsheet. Um, I think people who know more about zoning than I do can in, uh, enter information into the spreadsheet if you look at it. Uh, specific to your own town. So I'm just going to go through a few things really quickly. Um, from the SNAP network, or is, I hope everybody's, ref I think everybody would be uh, aware of this. I think the members of the public, it's a uh, network with the EPA, the federal EPA uh, in New England uh, th um, that's addressing things. So Quote, climate change, including rising temperatures, sea level rise, stronger storms, more intense freeze-thaw cycles, and increased frequency of drought are creating immeasurable challenges for communities, unquote. Quote, at the local level, municipalities have a significant power to avoid these impacts by implementing land use policies and development designs. And some of this is going to be review for most of you because you're pretty good at this. Some relevant points, uh, nature-based solutions to combat climate change cost-effective low-impact development LID techniques, green infrastructure, stormwater management, open space residential design. On Nantucket, the following boards and committees can be part of the conversation related to land use and adaptation techniques. This is a partial list and others can also be included. Planning Board, Conservation Commission, Historic District Commission, Board of Health, Select Board, um, Historical Commission, Planning and Land Use Services, Nantucket Islands Land Bank, Town of Nantucket, Town Natural Resource Department, Town Coastal Resilience Office, and the Nantucket Planning and Economic Development Commission. And I'm going to just go through a couple of comments really quickly when I finish. From the SNAP network, um, interdepartmental coordination is key. Design for storms of the future, not the storms of the past. Have conversations early and often. And finally, the Rhode Island Municipal Self-Assessment. Uh, download it from SNAP Network, um, Lower Impact Development Self-Assessment, Site Planning Design Strategy, Mimic Natural uh, Treatment Processes and Soil and Vegetation to Maintain Pre-Development Hydrology. So basically what this is, is it's a, a tool to enter information from your town's um, zoning bylaws and other information into the spreadsheet. Um, I couldn't get it to work. I, I, I don't have the, the working knowledge of zoning. I think it's important for us as a group to continue to, to uh, include planning and land use services, uh, local zoning experts such as Megan Trudell uh, to help us advise us on zoning. Um, but the tool is available and it's, um, I think it would probably work pretty well if you knew what you were doing. Um, it was kind of out of my wheelhouse um, I think it's important, um, some of these points, uh, like low impact development techniques and green infrastructure, um, and stormwater management. And I think that's kind of all in our wheelhouse, um, open space, residential design is, is some newer things. So if anybody has any questions or comments, um, you got it. So on the, the, the website that Carl referenced is, um, that the address is in our agenda, if anybody wants to go back to that later. Uh, Leah, would you go ahead and put up the spreadsheet tool? Uh, there are also some PDF documents and other things. Uh, there's a lot of information to absorb on that website and the associated pages. Um, but we wanted to just give you a look at what the tools look like. That uh, Tools is sort of a, a misnomer, I would call these. Um, hints <laughs> because that it's not really doing the work for you it's just giving you a way to organize and suggesting the work that you could be doing um so carl if you wanted to say anything about these particular pages was there anything that jumped out at you as important or uh worth mentioning sure. um from i speak a little of the zoning language when you're on the planning board you learn you know the difference between r5 and, and lug two but basically what's happening here is you can, um, you see some not applicable things that are in here. Um, goal one to protect natural resources and open space. Um, 
community subdivision rules and regulations. Um, that's the Massachusetts subdivision control law. Um, committees, community site plan review uh, uh, could be entered. Um, and then stormwater and low impact development bylaw regulations, um, bylaw and regulations can be entered. So it takes a little research to, to plug in these things to the tool. And then you've got, you know, promote efficient compact development patterns and infill. If you scroll up a little, Leah, please, um, you bring that one up. Uh, there you go. So it has, you know, some not, not applicable things, but you have zoning. You have lot size, like R5 is 5,000 square feet, R10 is 10,000 and so forth. Uh, you can put that in there. Um, housing density um, and setbacks and frontage, which would be, you know, a 10 foot setback. You could enter that in. So the more, I think the more information you put into this tool, the easier it is to use it. But you're right, Mary, it probably, you have to do most of the work. You have frontage, you have common driveways. You know, like the planning board, you have to get a special permit often for a second curb cut to access a property. So that would be like common driveways. Um, and then that, you know, it's sort of like a language that you're speaking. Uh, smart decisions that reduce overall improvements, you know, like yes. paving parking lots and things like that. Um, you know, would you use gravel? Would you use asphalt? Would you use um, shells or something like that? Um, to reduce runoff in the stormwater system, you would have, a, you would regulate impervious surfaces, for example. Um, so you can go through it. Um, if anybody can download this and look at it, but it's basically entering information regarding Nantucket's bylaws and Nantucket's information regarding development. Um, so, you know, it works, but it, it's pretty complex. <laughs> so... That's basically it. I mean, you do a road width, you know, you would have, you know, on a road width, you know, developments here can be 20 feet wide. They could be 40 feet wide. They can be 12 feet wide with Cape Cod curbing. It depends what the planning board's looking at as far as a, like a hammerhead development, like a rear lop subdivision where the road could be 12 feet wide, or it could be another subdivision where the road's 20 feet wide. So that's what goes in there like community subdivision rules and regulations, for example. So it's kind of like speaking the language of zoning and entering information into this tool, like call the sacks are there um, and curbing, things like that. So it's things that folks on this committee probably know about some of you, sidewalks. Um, and it's about development rules on the books for the local zoning. It's about state rules of development of the rules and regulation governing the subdivision of land. Uh, major commercial developments are relative to this. Rooftop runoff is an interesting one. Um, overall stormwater design. Um, you know, there's a number of, uh, there's dozens of stormwater pipes going into the harbor and they back up during high tides now in flooding situations into the streets. So that's really important. How are we gonna deal with that? Um, we'll probably touch on that in the future. Um, so you, you're basically entering a lot of information about the local rules and regulations. And I think the, the commission could, could help get some help from PLUS on this. And I understand there was a meeting with them at some point in the past, but they speak this language as for their living to, to make their living. And it's, you know, here's a, here's a permeable paving one, for example, you know, you can make paving that's that, that drains water better than asphalt. So <laughs> it's complicated, but in some ways it's simple. So. Yeah. And, and this is a 10 tab spreadsheet. So there's yeah. an overwhelming <laughs> amount of information. It's here. huge. <laughs> I think the best way to do that would be to break it up into little chunks and, you know, pick yeah. some like stormwater and say, okay. And here, yeah, yeah. Here's stor stormwater discharge detection and elimination. You know, how, how are we going to make the storm drains on easy street work during an astronomical high tide with a new moon or a full moon? I mean, they have those big black flaps on them. If you look over the, over the pier at easy street basin, they're designed to block the storm drains during a high tide, they have a big rubber flap, which is literally a door that's supposed to that's supposed to stop the stormwater from backing up. I don't know if they work very well, but 
you know, you can, you can see stormwater coming up through the cash basin. I mean, uh, floodwaters coming up through the cash basins downtown. So that's a challenge for us as a group to look into that. Um, and then it says post-construction stormwater management and drainage patterns. Um, and there's some, you know, conventional better best. And then once again, there's subdivision rules, community site plan review and so on and so forth. So as built surveys, as built surveys are usually required. Uh, enforcement, you know, who enforces this stuff um, in the town? And then, um, you know, encourage efficient parking. Parking is always an issue on this island, downtown, everywhere else. You know, so it's really it's fascinating in a way. It's it's actually pretty cool. But like you say, Mary, it's pretty overwhelming. It's it's a huge document. <laughs> but, so. But Mass Audubon, Mass Audubon has done a lot of work on this, and, and, it, and it, it would take a lot of hours to really load it up with all the regulations and, and see what it does. So, but um, they've got some interesting things here related to us here on the island. So. Thank you, Carl, for, for being willing to dive into it. Um, yeah. <laughs> I guess I'm only scratching the surface. <laughs> yeah, well, dip, dip your toe in the water, maybe I should yeah. say. Yeah. Um, any questions or comments? Yes, Christy. Yeah, I was just going to remind the committee uh, that the town is embarking on a, a stormwater enterprise fund um, that uh, we are funding um, also for uh, CMOM, which we did for the, uh, the sewer systems um, infrastructure, which is the capacity management operations and maintenance plan, which basically really logs um, everything uh, in the way of uh, maintenance and operations and repairs. And it's just a, an incredible tool for the uh, sewer department to utilize um, to you know, best approach uh, management of the sewer system. And that we are currently embarking on that um, with the uh, stormwater uh, uh, enterprise fund. So um, good timing, we will see some, a lot more, um, uh, attention paid to stormwater instead of it sort of falling under kind of, uh, um, you know, the sort of sewer department uh, in its own way. Yeah, and, and as is true in many cases, maintenance is key. Yeah. Uh, and the zoning regulations will not address or specify maintenance or, um, and they might specify enforcement, but still execution of that enforcement is a separate matter. Carl? Yeah, just following up on what Christy said, you're probably aware of this too. Over the last 10 or 15 years, the, the town uh, has embarked on a infiltration, uh, addressing infiltration into sewer pipes uh, in the Brant Point area, for example, uh, redoing the sewer system uh, in order to prevent salt and fresh water from infiltrating into the, the sewer system and putting more pressure on the Surfside treatment facility. And I knew a friend of mine, Robert Ingalls, who was involved with the sewer system, uh, the sewer department his whole career. And he said what they did was they went, they basically went through all the streets and redid the pipes and they were able to cut infiltration of salt and fresh water into the system dramatically. And Christy, you'd probably know about this in your work on it. And it, it cuts down the, the millions of gallons that are going out to Surfside by cutting down infiltration that we don't want. So it's an interesting story of infrastructure that was that was upgraded um, to pipes that do not let other water into the sewer system to be pumped to through C Street to the Surfside treatment facility, and they were very successful in reducing that water in the Brand Point area because they redid all the pipes, and now they have less water going out to Surfside uh, because of it, and and that's something that they're working on. I think in other low lying sewer districts. Uh, we'd lost the end of Carl's audio there. That was odd. He was not muted, but I couldn't hear him at least. Um, so, all right. Any other comments um, on this uh, opportunity for reviewing zoning regulations? Anybody want to take it on? <laughs> uh, 
um, it, it's it's the kind of thing is I think that breaking it up into smaller bits and focusing on an area you know one at a time is probably going to be the way that it's approached. Uh, but it's really useful to have recommendations for what are better and what are best um, in terms of what should be in the regulations to uh, address coastal resilience issues. So thank you again, Carl, for being willing to bring this in and then give us an introduction to it. Uh, next item on our agenda is public comment. If there are members of the public that want to make a comment at this time, please use the raise hand feature to indicate that. RJ, RJ Turcotte. Thank you, Chair Longacre. RJ Turcotte on behalf of the Nantucket Land Council. I have two comments to make. Um, so first, rewinding back to the Baxter Road issue, um, as far as offshore sourcing of sand for mitigation projects, it's actually never been done in the state of Massachusetts. So that was something that SPPF had planned to embark on uh, before they backed out. And it's likely going to be a multi-year permitting process for whoever does it first. And um, there are other states that are doing it, but I will say from a marine biologist's perspective, uh, there's a lot of robbing Peter to pay Paul going on where uh, they're harming offshore environments to mitigate projects on shore. So that's just something else to consider. Uh, so that's my first comment. And then my second actually plays into this. And um, I attend a lot, I attend a lot of town board and committee meetings and have been on some committees. And I'm wondering if there could be a discussion on potentially restructuring how public comment works at CRAC, because uh, it always seems like by the time the public gets around to commenting on things, we're well past um, when the discussion was happening. And that can be problematic for folks who are taking time out of their workday to try to get their thoughts into you guys on various issues. So um, just a thought, thank you. Thank you, RJ. Burton Balkine. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanna um, um, affirm what um, TJ just said uh, about uh, the uh, the process of um, the meetings. If I, I would like to be able to comment when um, we're discussing a matter, make, make it a way for the public to add their input said at the end, uh, and I might uh, raise my hand earlier about um, the wording, which you've already voted on. So I, I'll say my piece. I think in that, I think you did the right thing by taking out the geotubes and not trying to confront anyone. But I think mentioning the Arcadis report, which I think the town based the coastal resiliency plan on would have been a smart move because that was, um, um, you know, an outside consultant and neutral party deciding um, you know, and how to move forward there. And I think including some of their words would have been a good idea, but um, you've already voted on it. So it's a kind of a mute point, but um, I wanted to say my piece. Thank you for the time, Madam Chair. Thank you, Barton. Any other members of the public present that have a comment at this time? Seeing none. Uh, next item is approval of the minutes from May 23rd. Uh, Leah, can you go ahead and put those on the screen? Uh, sorry, um, do we have those? I've, I've forgotten. Mary, they're not ready. Um, not ready. So yeah, just the next meeting in July. They're great, thank you. Um, next item on the agenda is the um, New Business Committee and Natural Resources Department re and reports from any uh, representatives on other committees. But Leah, anything that you wanted to report here? Sure. Um, I already updated you all about the CZM grant, and actually this morning I had a photo shoot with N Magazine. They're doing a piece on um, my new position as the Coastal Resilience Coordinator, so that'll be out um, the next, I'm not sure, either in July or August, whatever their next issue is. Excellent. And I'd also like to thank Mary for being a great chair, and um, you know, you, you have really run this committee since the inception of it. And you have been a great chair, um, you know, ha having a smooth transition for me from my previous position into this one. So thank you so much. You're welcome, thank you. Uh, Peter Brace uh, is able to give an update on the Nantucket and Madiket Harbors plan. Uh, I know you've had some public meetings recently, Peter. 
Peter, you're on mute. What you asked me to do was to report on the coastal resilience table at um, our public meeting. It was held on June 5th. Is that correct? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So I obviously didn't take notes because I was one of the facilitators along with um, Leah, uh, but there was one of the urban harbors um, staff taking notes and he sent me his notes. And I'm basically just going to read what he, he, he put down. Is that okay? Sure. Okay, so um, questions from the audience were, how does the CRP from crack fit with the Harbor Plan? If we throw money at CO2, can we stop dune breakthrough from happening? There was this one guy who just, you know, kind of went head to head with Vince on this issue and how important it was. And um, he's really, he, he has a house in Grand Point. Um, but I was impressed that someone was actually paying attention to the fact that Code 2 could eventually be broken up into pieces over time. And he just, he was relentless. Um, what should we do to protect the harbor? Uh, how do we address flooding in the downtown area? Where does funding come from? Aside from federal funding sources, how are we going to pay for all this? Um, why can't we, why hasn't something been, been passed to stop fertilizer usage? Are you trying to make buildings more resilient or natural areas uh, more resilient? Will they open Old South Point to improve the water quality in Madigan Harbor? I don't know what Old South Point is, but um, and then topics for dis of discussion uh, at the table: integration between plans and cooperation between organizations. Um, in parentheses, municipal CRP. Trustees of Reservations Plans, uh, Nansa Turkey Conservation Foundation Plans, Harbor Plan, Private Property Owners, Public Private Partnerships, and parentheses. Uh, top down meeting, bottom up, uh, grassroots organization momentum meeting, governmental cert certifications. And then CO2, uh, CO2. Dune breakthrough, trustees and NCF want to keep CO2 natural, might conflict with harbor protection goals. Um, Woods Hole Group consulting on CO2 breakthrough issues. Uh, regulations limiting harbor protection measures, uh, for example, groins, bulkheads. Wall in at harbor garbage aggregation, need for dredging for uh, water circulation. Um, Island-wide sediment transport study and dredge plan. Beneficial reuse of dredging um, spoils, avoiding contaminated sediments. Downtown uh, neighborhood flood barrier. Concerns with funding sources and pace of progress. Concerns with where uh, water will go during flooding of downtown. Harbor walkway, which I assume is the uh, resilience walk. Will it improve resilience? Or maybe they're maybe they were talking about the berm. Opportunities for hard barrier and leading salt marsh uh, parentheses NBS regulations limiting and constructing over salt marshes. Washington Street is a major thoroughfare. Flooding concerns. What you say? Grant Point, jetty redirect, redirecting waves that dislodge rocks into harbor, jetty causing Grant Point flooding, jetty improving flushing of harbor, allowing for shellfishing, long runoff causing poor water quality in Brant Harbor. Uh, Madiket, entrance for creek going into Long Pond is six inches deep, used to be six feet deep. They used to dredge it. Issues with the water flow at Cambridge Street Bridge. Water can't get out. Uh, waterfall coming into culvert. Desire to have DPW maintain. Punky silt in Madiket Harbor. Old South Point opening to improve Madiket Harbor water quality. Or Old Smith Point. Um, uh, fisheries. Lingvia negatively impacting uh, scalp fisheries. And I believe they're talking about the lingvia, which is the macroalgae that is 
this black gooey stuff all over the bottom. Successive oyster farms cleaning up Lingbia, question, question mark. Desire for nature-based solutions to be part of any harbor protection solution funding. Where does it come from? Do we create a coastal resilience fund tied to taxes or home purchases? Question mark. Uh, land bank, successive land bank park across from Dreamland built in educational manner. Coastal resilience goals might involve shifting of the mission of the land bank. Um, Geotubes did essentially nothing. Resilience is a shared problem, have mechanisms that facilitate neighborhood action or objectives for individual neighborhoods or individual people. Resilience is about learning and adapting and trying to live with it. Um, and then it says Leah Hill note, notes, improving or enhancing, restoring marshes and oyster reefs using alternative nature-based methods. Um, and that's it. Thank you, Peter. So quite a lot there that is directly related to the work that we're doing. Um, so right. I appreciate knowing that. And uh, glad that we have a representative on that committee. And, and so um, the Harbor Plan Committee met yesterday and we are discussing um, further, we basically discussed other public uh, engagement opportunities, which, will in, which could include, well, will include another public meeting and we were trying to decide whether we we're going to have one in um, July and in August. We're definitely going to have one in August, um, and we're sort of starting to plan that. And then we were talking about having Kim Starbuck, who's sort of the lead for Urban Harbors, uh, help, helping us do the plan, having her um, set up a table somewhere to get information to the public. And so uh, that it sounds like she's going to try and do that at the Farmers and Artisans Market. Um, as a nonprofit table, um, which is what what we allow, we allow a, um, or on a rotating basis nonprofits to set up and and, and spread their message. It well, sounds like that's what she wants to do. So, great, thank you, Peter. Joanna, thanks, Mary. Um, I'd just like to give a quick uh, update on the Clean Water Coalition, if that's okay. Oh, you're frozen. Hello. Uh, go ahead. I can hear you. Can okay, great. Um, I just wanted to let folks know that the Clean Water Coalition is doing a speaker series on Tuesday, the 11th of July at Great Harbor Yacht Club from 4.30 to 6.30. And Jeff Carlson, Roberto, and David, and Mark will all be coming. And we are doing a kind of question and answer session that is focused on three things, water quality, stormwater, or four things, water quality, stormwater, wastewater, and fertilizer. And we're doing that that Thursday, July 11th, and then again on Monday, July, Monday, August 28th at the Nantucket Yacht Club. So we're doing it twice. We're bringing this so that uh, the public has a chance to um, come and listen to those four people talk about those important issues around water quality. Will that be recorded, Joanna? Um, I, it's in person. I don't know if it will be recorded, but okay. I'll double check. Uh, Peter and then Sarah. I just want to remind everyone um, that the Nantucket Land Council will be having its um, annual State of the Harbor Forum on July 18th, I believe at 4.30, and I think it's at the Nantucket Yacht Club, was the last two years. Um, and it, it's, it's usually well attended and very informative and probably have some coastal resilience um, uh, implications. Um, should definitely go. Thank you, Peter. Sarah? Thanks, Mary. I just, um, for the notes, I wanted to ask Joanna about the Nantucket Yacht Club one. I got July 11th for the Great Harbor Yacht Club, but the date and the time I missed. Sorry, I waited until you <laughs> took a bite. <laughs> on Tuesday, the 11th, it's 4.30 to 6.30. And on Monday, August 28th, it's also 4.30 to 6.30. August 28th, thank you, 4.30 to 6.30. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, Peter, is your hand up again or is it still up from last time? Okay. Um, any other reports from committee members? 
Right, um, so we do have a slot on July 5th at the select board meeting. Uh, Leah and I will be presenting the Coastal Resilience Advisory Committee's updated recommendation regarding sea level rise, uh, which was approved in September of last year. Um, the, the document is not going to change from what was approved then. The, the holdup was that there was a request for a summary, um, which is a, is a normal um, process and a, a document called an agenda item summary is developed for anything that's submitted to the select board to give them the, the 20,000 foot view. And um, Vince and Leah and I have had many, many things to do. And unfortunately that kept getting pushed off, but we did wanna make sure it got done um, before I left. So that will be, I think my last official action on July 5th uh, to be presenting that to the select board. Um, just, just a heads up for everyone. Uh, last item on the agenda, discussion of upcoming meeting dates and topics. Uh, so our next meeting is July 11th, um, 10 a.m. on Zoom. And um, because we will not have a chair on July 11th, since my term is ending June 30th, uh, and because Peter has let us know that he will not be available for that meeting either, we will not have a chair or a vice chair for that meeting. Um, so we've looked up what the committee guidelines say need to be done. And so someone will have to be uh, selected to be a temporary chair for the purposes of electing the chair, vice chair and secretary for the next fiscal year at that meeting. So I wanted to give everybody a heads up of how that was going to work and remind everybody that you should let you know if you're interested in serving as the chair, vice chair or secretary for the next year. Um, Lee, I think that's everything we needed to say about that. Is there anything else? for our next meeting? No. Gary? So um, I'd like to bring up a subject um, for a future topic. Mm -hmm. And it's not quite an epiphany that I've had again, but uh, I had one early on, recall when I started talking about infrastructure. But sitting at my advisory committee meeting the other day, listening to Tucker Holland talk about affordable housing, and at all of our crack meetings, we talk about the various things that need to get done in the future. And suddenly it came to me that uh, we have one issue that is, I guess it's the third rail of politics in Nantucket, but it's something I would love the, our committee crack to start thinking about and take seriously. Uh, and I'm probably gonna push my advisory committee, although it's not mine anymore, uh, but I'm still on it uh, to do the same thing. And that is um, something Tucker said at our last meeting we had uh, last weekend, when we talked about um, a land on the island of Nantucket that is still open for development. And what he told us uh, was so uh, unbelievable that it started all of us thinking about it, especially me and others, and what basically Tucker told us is that on the, on the entire island of Nantucket, only 4% of the land is developable left. That's all that's left. And when we hear about the issues of affordable housing, which is probably our single highest priority of everything on the island. And then we talk about coastal resilience and we talk about buyout programs and things like that. I put the two together and I say, you know, it's, a, it's time to start having serious discussions about using some portion of the land bank's land for, for people who want to reside here, whether it's residents or people that are forced to move as a result of, of uh, climate change and coastal change. And it's something that um, I think the time has come for us to look at that as a committee because if it helps serve our need for affordable housing, and if it helps us deal with the kind of relocation that we're going to have as water continues to erode people living on the coasts here, um, it's something that I, 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 I'd like to start the ball rolling a little bit. As I say, I know it's kind of a third rail, but it, the time has now come when you think that only 4% of the island is really open for development now. 53% in conservation. The rest of it is either in residential or commercial and 4% left. 
And what are we going to do about affordable housing? What are we going to do about all the relocation? So that's why I think I, I'd like to figure out how we can talk about that as uh, I don't know how it can be done, whether we have to change legislation or the land bank has to just agree to it or annual town meeting, but it's a subject that I'd like to talk about at a future meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Um, I, I want to remind the committee that we cannot have a discussion on Gary's request for a future topic until that topic is posted on an agenda. So if there are comments on different topics or Sarah, if you need a clarification for the minutes, um, we can definitely do that, but we cannot respond to Gary and begin a discussion on that today. Um, Sarah? I wasn't going to respond to Gary, just to add that I, if we're gonna have that discussion to make sure that the representatives of the land bank are here. So Rachel's obviously not here today, but like just making sure. And then also not just land bank, I think it's a, a bigger issue for the conservation groups in general. So ensuring that both Rachel and Jen and their respective executive directors are invited. So not responding to Gary, but just adding that if that's a topic, I think that it needs to be more than just the land bank and quite comprehensive. Thank you, Sarah. Carl? Yes, I'd just like to see on a future agenda discussion of uh, possible funding sources for CR projects on the island. And I think it would be good to have Matt Fee here for that. In the same vein, uh, Sarah is having land bank representatives. I'd like to have Matt in attendance for such a future topic. I have mentioned in the past of um, uh, host community agreements with wind farm developers in the mass resource area as a possible source of funding. But I was just hoping in the future we could have a discussion about uh, fund, possible extra funding for CR projects and hopefully Matt would be in attendance. Thank you, Carl. Joanna? There we go. Um, okay, I've got a couple of comments. I, I'm not going to respond to what Gary is saying, but would support adding that to a future agenda. I think it's a conversation that we should be having. It's being had, so we should be having it here. And I support Sarah's um, recommendation that the other EDs and their representatives on this committee come to that meeting to discuss. Uh, with regard to the financial piece, this is something that I have been um, talking about for a long time, maybe the whole time I've been on this committee. And I think that um, the place to start there really is having Brian Turbett come back because we're going to be heading into budget season, believe it or not, uh, in September. And I think that certainly, you know, the finance committee <clears throat> and others have been having conversations around how to fund the coastal resiliency plan and we know what happened last year uh, but i'm going to strongly advocate again that we hire a grant writer because all of these there's so many grants especially in the federal government that are um, available for us to apply for and i think that we should have that conversation now and make sure that it gets into the budget for 2024. Thank you, Joanna. Any further comments on upcoming meeting dates and topics? No, if none, we can take a motion to adjourn. I'll make the motion to adjourn. Thank you, Carl. Second. Second. Thank you, Peter. Roll call vote, Gary Beller. Aye. Sarah Boyce. Aye. Rob Borchard. Aye. Your Brace. Aye. Christy Kickham. Aye. Joanna Roach. Aye. And Mary Longacre, aye. Thank you all. Thank you, Mary. Thanks, Mary. <laughs> Stay dry, Thanks, everybody. Mary. <laughs> Spot on. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> Thank you all.